Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares with the news from the global economy. Coming up today, Tel Aviv hosts the Israel Business Conference, the country's leading economic event. And senior economist Peter Jarrett from the OECD discusses Israel's ranking. First, the headlines. China's trade surplus climbed to a record in November following an unexpected decline in imports on lower crude oil and other commodity prices. Overseas shipments rose 4.7 percent from a year earlier, while imports fell 6.7 percent, leaving a trade surplus of $54.47 billion. The slide in oil prices to five-year lows offers China a double benefit as its leadership confronts the weakest expansion in 24 years. The decline could boost economic growth and help keep inflation slow enough, allowing for further easing after last month's interest rate cut. Germany's industrial output rose for a second month in October, though it expanded less than originally forecast. Manufacturing output in October rose by 0.2 percent, while construction output expanded by 1.4 percent, indicating steady, albeit slow, expansion. September data, however, were revised down to 1.1 percent compared with an initial reading of a 1.4 percent increase. Gross domestic product barely grew in the third quarter after a contraction in the three months through June. Japan's economy shrank more than previously estimated in the third quarter as capital spending declined and private consumption remained weak. The economy contracted 1.9 percent during the July to September period, more than the initial estimate of 1.6 percent. The economy has now shrunk for two consecutive quarters, putting Japan in recession less than a week before general elections. The polls show that 51 percent of Japanese disapprove of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe his economic policies, his Liberal Democratic Party is still expected to win in the absence of a powerful opposition. Iran unveiled a draft budget for next year that assumes steady oil prices around $70 and the country becoming less dependent on crude. Non-oil-based revenues in 2015 will make up slightly more than half the government's total income. As oil revenues for the budget drop, to $24 billion from $27.5 billion, the share of non-oil-based revenues would rise to 53 percent from 47. Iran has the world's fourth largest proven oil reserves and currently exports around 1.3 million barrels per day. Our economy must move towards non-oil exports. The oil price drop is a new opportunity to accelerate this. Despite ongoing protests, Greece's government pushed ahead a disputed 2015 budget plan promising more growth and austerity. Thousands of Greeks rallied outside the parliament against the budget plan, which projects growth for a second consecutive year. Unions protested the plans for more austerity in 2015, saying four years of reforms reduced the standard of living, raised unemployment and increased poverty. The government is in talks with EU and IMF lenders to exit its bailout package at the end of the year, more than a year ahead of its scheduled end in early 2016. But foreign lenders fear Greece will miss a 0.2 percent deficit target given a new payback plan for austerity hit Greeks who owe money to the state. The crucial issue from now on, the key to growth and the lowering of unemployment is to continue the reform program even after the end of the bailout. The new reform program is not going to be forced upon us by our partners. On the contrary, we choose to implement it because it is the only road that will secure sustainable growth. We want this government to fall because with this budget they are voting to further cut wages and pensions. We have already lost our jobs, but at least we can keep on fighting for those who have a job. As this year's Globe's Israel Business Conference in Tel Aviv draws to an end, social justice and the global impact of the U.S. shale boom are some of the primary topics discussed. I turn for news, Karen Kirsch and Daniel Roth with the story. Globe's Business Convention 2014, Israel's premier business conference, brought together more than 4,000 people from Israel and around the world to talk business, politics, and the future of the economy. Israeli President Reuven Rivlin opened the event, reiterating the importance of democratic values in looking forward. 
קרנית פלוג, גוונר של הבנק של ישראל, אדרסת רצינות אקונומית קונסרנס. I spoke about the price of the cost of living for the average consumer, but what happens to different groups within the population? Does this tell the story of the price increase for different groups, such as for different percentiles? In previous years, the Globus Conference was also target of protest, blaming the business world of detachment from the people's needs. And contributing to the growing inequality this year the conference commenced calmly but these issues made their way into the discussion as we saw in Karnit's flu session and in panels such as waking up from the American dream the subject of social justice is of vital importance to Israelis these days with a recent minimum wage hike agreement in the private sector Israel seems to be looking ahead last week an agreement was struck between major employers in the private sector and the chief union in Israel to increase the minimum wage it still doesn't apply to the public sector of course if employers reach this kind of agreement they have good reason for it but it will take some time until it will take effect it will only start in April and perhaps the upcoming elections will delay it a bit but not for long and Progress that may be once again derailed by political instability and upcoming elections. It's not the first time we enter an election season, and it's not the first time there is a change of finance minister. I personally have been in this position under three different ministers, all changed in the same kind of circumstances. It's true there is a need to minimize the period of instability and transition quickly to a stable government that can pass a budget. But the conference is most certainly not focused on local matters. Jason Fruman, chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisers, was among the international players on the scene. Looking at global issues, and in particular, the major impact of North American oil on the global economy. Oil production in the United States, which increased by more than a million and a half barrels, bringing the total increase in production to the United States in the last six years to more than three and a half million barrels. That's the equivalent of discovering a new Iraq right in the United States. It's made the United States the global leader in oil production. As issues from oil prices to social justice take center stage in global economies, they continue to find their way into major forums like this too. And we also had the opportunity to interview some of the key world economic players and decision makers that attended this leading economic event. Following is an interview with Peter Jarrett, a senior economist at the OECD. With us now is Peter Jarrett, senior economist at the OECD. Mr. Jarrett, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. How does Israel look on the OECD indices compared to other countries in the OECD? Well, the OECD covers a whole gamut of uh, different uh, measures. And in some areas, uh, Israel is, uh, stands out in a very positive way. For example, how much research is done as a share of GDP. Israel's far and away the, the, the top in the OECD. Nobody comes near. In other areas, uh, Israel uh, does much more in the, pa- in the, in the peloton, in the pack. Uh, quite a number of them but uh, and then there are some that where Israel doesn't do well at all and I guess I would cite uh, some of the education outcomes uh, which are are really uh, disturbing uh, while Israel does have as all countries do students who do very well it has a, a very high proportion of students who don't and particularly from some of the uh, the minority groups and I just saw a chart actually earlier um, in one of the presentations that Israel's uh, educational uh, level was much ho- was higher than the OECD's level before in the 90s and from around 2004 or something it just went down like it just you know it, it was a steep down uh, curve do you know what it's related to um, well one of the things might be um, Uh, the fact that that these minority groups where you really have problems with are becoming a bigger share of the total number of, of uh, children in school minority groups being specifically the ultra orthodox and, and the, the Arab Arabs. community yes so uh, uh, to the extent it could be just arithmetic in the sense that if they are a bigger share of the total sample uh, and I, I believe they're constantly becoming a bigger share and this is going to continue. Uh, so that that emphasizes the need to take actions and and some actions are being taken but uh, standards have to be raised uh, uh, to uh, to avoid having an underclass 
that will be there uh, for decades and decades. If you had the opportunity to advise Israel's next finance minister, what would you tell him? Well, I would say that, that, uh, you know, that more resources have to be made available for education in particular and, and training. We just had a session on the labor market and I think uh, training is uh, for the existing uh, working age population who have passed uh, compulsory schooling age. Uh, more has to be done too, uh, if necessary, by making it compulsory. Uh, because I think uh, th that is a big problem. Another thing is uh, is uh, competition, which in a, a whole slew of, er of areas, uh, our uh, competition is not sufficiently vigorous, and too many um, uh, controls and too many interferences by government. Uh, the outgoing Minister of Finance seemed to think that uh, controlling prices was was good thing, good way to go when prices are too high. But the the evidence from the OECD uh, in the past, when there were more price controls, is that that it doesn't work and that it just introduces distortions. But uh, we think that that competition is really important, particularly in some of the network industries. Uh, the uh, the electricity sector is is a pretty obvious one, and and uh, in general uh, a reduction in in uh, in red tape uh, uh, permits uh, take too long here to to get, and and that should be a focus of of uh, all ministers, finance included. Well, Peter Jarrett, senior economist at OECD, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Said. And we're joined now by i for News reporter Daniel Roth for a look at some of the other remarkable stories from the world press in Media Watch. So, Daniel, hey. welcome. Thanks. How's it going? Good. I understand you're taking us to the uh, car capital or historical car capital of yeah, America. I think probably historic car capital is more correct these mm. days. Uh, the New York Times had this remarkable uh, set of photos uh, taken from above Detroit. Uh, and Detroit is really these days, when you think of Detroit, you think of American decline. Uh, you think it's it's kind of become not the car capital, mm, but right. really the decline capital of America. Decades of white flight to the suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're talking about the last few years of, or few decades at this point of of jobs, manufacturing jobs, auto jobs heading out of the country, not just out of Detroit, right. and uh, the city going deeper and deeper into poverty. And so, you know, this guy, this uh, photographer, explains. He's, he says, you know, you from outside the city limits, you see these five car garages, swimming pools, and pool houses. Uh, and as you fly into and over the city, you start to see blocks of boarded up and burned out homes. He's talking about this. He says this type of blight, it's visible in other American cities, but few compare to the emptiness uh, that surrounds Detroit's downtown is uh, what it, what's written in this article. Um, and it's really, really stark when you look at these photos. There's really interesting stuff going on in Detroit, things yeah. like the Heidelberg Project, which is this full neighborhood kind of art project, mm -hmm. um, interesting NGOs setting up shop there. One of the effects of all this space, of all this emptiness, is that creative people are starting to look at Detroit as potentially sort of a canvas with which to experiment with new kinds of economies, sure. new kinds of trade, new kinds of art. Uh, the problem, though, is that before Detroit's almost skipping that artist phase that gentrification yeah. often takes and going straight to the corporate phase. Uh, uh, corporations, major real estate companies are buying enormous swaths of the city. And you're seeing this kind of culture of privatization make its mark in areas like water, which is supposed to be a utility in, in the United States. Uh, people, tens of thousands of people in recent months have found their water cut off for being, uh, being behind on their payments as little as $150. Uh, so, you know, we're seeing a real shift in 
Detroit over okay. the last century. Right. Uh, and it's remarkable indeed. in these photos. Yeah. Um, the other story we have is from Business Insider, and it's, uh, you know, we've been talking about this, everyone's talking about this, the decline of oil prices, right. of course. Now Wall Street analysts are looking ahead to the next year, and they're seeing, they're agreeing with reality, which is good, mm -hmm. that analysts mm -hmm. are agreeing with reality, sure. reality and saying, uh, you know, the energy sector overall could lose, you know, 14, 15 percent of its value. So uh, we're seeing that oil, is, the decline is going to hit the entire energy sector in, in ways unforeseen yet. Right. Um, they're only starting to foresee them. Uh, one of the interesting effects is that oil may not ever make a comeback if we're lucky if this decline continues and alternative energies gain more and more traction. Solar if alternative and energies actually really do take this opportunity, so to speak, and, um, you know, go into the market as they should. Absolutely. And, and uh, it is an opportunity and we're seeing real growth in places like Germany for solar. Uh, the question is, will that kind of make its mark worldwide and will we start to see a move away from oil uh, in the long term and the broad view? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dan and Roth, for joining us. Thank you. Oh, well, that concludes our Economy Magazine, your daily source for economic and financial reports. I'm Benjamin Jonathan Fires. Thanks for watching.